Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems by biased collection in particular. Um, today, something very, very biased because it's kind of a non-standard story. I'm using, going to use a non-standard terminology, which I usually like to call an inverse fractal, which I usually like to see as a zooming out procedure in contrast to the zooming in procedure. So in for the usual fractals, I like to think of this as a use, use a zooming out procedure out for the um, inverse fractals. So the distinction I kind of want to make, as we will see that on the first slide, is uh, the kind of inverse fractals. They usually come up in combinatorics. The structures that are contained in themselves, and if you draw a little piece of it and you draw a bigger, bigger piece, you will see it repeated. While the other fractals, the, the standard fractals, the Mandelbrot set or something, they usually come up in some dynamics, and they are usually like, like you know, everyone knows zooms in the Mandelbrot set. There are so many YouTube videos and whatever animations about zooms into the Mandelbrot set, and this really kind of zooms in. Kind of comes from combinatorics, sorry, from uh, dynamical systems, and the other one that I have in mind comes from combinatorics. So the dynamical systems one is clearly way well better known, it's kind of way more popular. Um, but I, I think the combinatorics one is actually pretty nice. So let me start with an example. So take Pascal's triangle modulo modulo some prime. So let's say you just d distinguish even and odd entries, uh, like in this little illustration, which you can. Or which I have uh, created using LaTeX, uh, just stolen using LaTeX. So where you put everything that is odd in a black box and everything that is even in a white box, well, and you zoom out, so this is just a little piece, and I think of it as a, being this infinite Pascal triangle that you usually see, and I kind of zoom out and it kind of gets this nice fractal pattern, which is Kind of, I think of it as being clearly coming from combinatorics, a Pascal's triangle binomial coefficients, some counting problem, and you just take a mod sum prime. This mod sum prime kind of generates a lot of those factors. I will come back to that uh, later. But I kind of like to think it's, it's not really rigorous, but I like to think of it as being opposed to the other way to create the same fractal, namely by this. A recursion where you have one triangle that you divide further, right? So here I'm zooming in in some sense because I have this triangle that I divide further, and here I'm zooming out because I have a think of it at least as being kind of an infinite triangle, and I like to zoom out, and it kind of gets a self-repeating pattern that you see uh, here, and if you zoom out further, kind of does the same, and I kind of would like to make this distinction. Which is a bit arbitrary, but it feel, I feel like this is how they turn up in nature, of something that comes from dynamics, the standard fractal where you zoom in, and there's usually some kind of iterative process, or something that comes from combinatorics, which where you zoom out. So in some sense, I think of Pascal's triangle as being there already. There is no iteration and no no process of that involved. If there is anything, it maybe goes backwards in some sense. Um, and I think of the other kind of uh, type of um, fractals as kind of being created using some iterative process. And yeah, so this for me distinguishes inverse fractals from fractals, but maybe the correct distinction here is one of them turns up in dynamics and one of them turns up in combinatorics. And yeah, Pascal's triangle mod 2, or you could take that mod any prime, is kind of a really good example of, of this behavior. Another example, and in some sense it's also Pascal's triangle, if you want, but just uh, shift to the side in my picture, but just as the bias of the picture, is the following. So uh, a lot of algorithms actually have fractal behavior as well, and that's again something discrete in contrast to dynamical systems. So say you have an algorithm, and it takes n squared operations. So how would I illustrate an algorithm that takes n squared operations? Well, I would draw a square. And I just fill it in because I need everything, right? N times N. N times N. That's just my picture. I draw a square. So this this guy here up here. Okay. But say, and this is kind of the idea of divided concord. There are kind of many, many algorithms who do who have this, this property. Say that you can save one operation. So let's say in the first square you see, the two by two square, two by two square, you could save one operation. Okay? So you have just 
So if one operation and in my illustration is just putting a white box somewhere. And then the idea of divide and conquer is whenever that happens, what you should do is now you start with, think of this, let's say, as being a matrix. So you have an N by N matrix and you save uh, kind of like this N by N matrix and you need to encode the N by N matrix and you somehow can only encode those entries here and the final entry in the top is already determined by the others. So you don't don't need to encode it in your, in your system. And then what people do, and this is divide and conquer, and this is good, you save one out of four operations, but maybe not too impressive. But now if you make the matrix bigger and bigger, what you can do is kind of apply the same procedure of saving one operation in the remaining boxes, right? I do it here again. Uh, so now I have one, I do the division here for you. So I save one box. So this is already empty here, so this is fine. Uh, and now I save one box in the other ones as well, because I do it recursively, and then so on. You save one box in the other ones as well, you save one box, you save one box, you save one box, and eventually it gets much, much faster. So here I've gone from an n squared operation to an n, well, it should be something like log uh, 4, 3 operation, which is like much, much faster than... Um, just the n squared operation, right? You save one operation and you do that recursively in each step, and this gives a lot of algorithms um, a recursive behavior. So what I've stolen here, this algorithm is based, or this picture is based on a real algorithm of how to multiply polynomials, which usually would take n squared operations, but you can do a bit faster if you use this save one operation thing. Um, but what I like about this picture is that this is again a fractal, obviously, if you just look at it, and it comes out as zooming out, right? So you have a big matrix, small matrix, and a lot of small matrices and big matrices, and you kind of zoom out. And it's clearly a discrete thing. It came out of analyzing the runtime of algorithms. It really just steps into operation and just a counting thing. Here's another example. This one is pretty nice. So coin toss, which is my probably the most discrete operation that you can think of, you're tossing a coin, they they have fractal behavior. And I'll show you one more, but even nicer example on the next slide. This is my theorem of choice. But here, um, for example, the curve formed by a coin toss is actually a fractal curve in a certain sense. So if I would zoom out, it would look again, kind of locally again, a lot of those little bumps kind of looks the same, and you zoom out and zoom out, and it gets more and more the same. So what I've done here is pretty simple, just list a 10, oh, in this case, a thousand uh, coin tosses, and positive numbers are heads, negative numbers are tails, and here's, for example, a long row of heads with a few tails because it goes backwards and whatever. Just list the number, just count the number, and yeah, just list them. So the average where you have equal number of heads and tails is here zero line and the curve you get with probability one of course it's a probability thing uh is uh and actually again an inverse fractal so almost always it's an inverse fractal and again an example that comes from combinatorics or probability theory if you want in this case but really crossing toins is just a, a yes or no thing so it's a very very discrete operation and you can continue, and there are plenty of examples, which are a little bit overlooked, I, I think, that's why I'm doing this video. And here's kind of my favorite theorem about those, um, a fractal graph. Yeah, graph, by definition, essentially, is a discrete object. And let's say we have a head of it on countably many vertices, so 0, 1, 2, 3, whatever, all the way up to um, 512. And I call it a fractal graph, by definition, for this video, is a graph such that if you divide it into um, finally many pieces, so at least one of them, because it's infinite, or at least one of them will be infinite. So if you divide it in finally many pieces, let's say you divide this one in the even ones and the odd ones, uh, something like this, you divide it in the even ones and the odd ones, so two, two pieces in this case, then at least one of the pieces will be isomorphic to the original graph. So it contains a non-trivial copy of itself, and it's again a zooming procedure. So if you if you list if you would list the look at this graph and I would zoom out, it would kind of look the same at all spots. Okay, that's what people call a fractal graph 
or let's say that's what I call a fractal graph here for this video. And turns out that you can classify them. So what, what graphs are inverse fractals? There are only three of them and two of them are completely boring. And you can tell completely ignore them. So my zooming procedure, my, my division procedure clearly works if my graph has no edges. Yeah, uh, that's not very exciting, but good. It clearly works if there are all edges possible, the complete graph. That's also not that exciting. And then there's one extra example, which is really cool, which has a name. It's called the Rado graph. And it has also this property, and it's the only interesting example with this property. And the way it comes up is it's a contours graph. So for every vertex, you cross a, for every pair of vertices, you, you toss a coin. And well, let's say when heads comes up, you put an edge. And when tail comes up, you don't put an edge. And it turns out that this graph is, has this property that essentially all infinite subgraphs are again isomorphic to itself. It's somewhat the only graph with that property. And here my favorite example of a discrete type of fractal thing. It's kind of really beautiful, right? So you, you take a pair of vertices and they're infinitely many from zero up to whatever. And you take a pair of them, you uh, cross the coin, coin flip, and then you just decide whether you put an edge or not. And almost surely, as I should have said it again, almost surely you will end up a graph where every subgraph, every infinite subgraph is a copy of itself. Yeah? Even though the, if I just take out the subgraph here on the even vertices, it will be isomorphic to the original graph. And that's not all of it. It's the only graph uh, with this property if we ignore the boring ones. Well, I hope that is a convincing theorem why I like it. It's kind of fun. So there's not just that there is a graph with this solution. No, there's only also a unique graph with this solution, ignoring the boring solutions. It's kind of a cool thing. And then those inverse fractals turn up like everywhere in combinatorics, mostly in combinatorics related to some mod modular behavior, like in my first example, um, the Pascal's triangle mod, mod, mod P. And then the zoo of examples comes from actually from representation theory. So representation theory of symmetric groups, for example, has a behavior as well. Uh, representation theory of general linear groups has that behavior. And those two kind of, even if you've never heard of them, um, they are kind of very notoriously difficult fields. For example, representation theory is now around for 130 years, let's say, and representation theory of the somatic groups um, over the complex numbers, the first field you would study, was done already 130 years ago. It is really nice, really beautiful. And over finite, over those, those uh, fields of finite characteristic, it's still mostly open. <laughs> which is kind of surprising. And partially the reason why this is still open is that algebra is don't expect fractals to come up. Somewhat you don't expect it in algebra because a fractal is more an object of, of uh, dynamics. And what people started to study in, in order to address those questions, um, and here have some examples of how they come up in those representations here. And what people decided to study uh, also in order to address those questions, is exactly what I'm trying to sell you in this video, the idea of discrete fractals. Discrete fractals and discrete dynamical systems associated to those fractals, which is kind of the key word I would like to sell at the end of this video. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.